oh no, they're installing 5G and they're going to kill us all because the telecoms industry only cares about profit. Well, unless the whole telecoms industry is planning to roll out 5G, sell it to everyone, and then implement a rapid change of business plan to go into the coffin-making business, then they can't exactly profit from you if you are dead. Maybe 5G is actually a conspiracy and a big coffin lobby is pushing for it to be rolled out. I always knew that you shouldn't trust funeral directors. So yeah, 5G is a thing and there are some really stupid people saying and doing some really stupid things. It is the same nonsense as what we had with UMTS and 4G, but this time we have much better internet for the numbskullery to spread. People are talking about uh, Bri-1 precursors and photon absorption at 60 gigahertz interfering with biological functions, whilst not actually having a fucking clue of what any of these words mean. All with a delicious helping of big numbers and some scary words on the side. Now, this has been an interesting one to try to address in the style that I usually do things in, and there is a lot to cover. Now, we are going to start off with a generic discussion of radiation, how radiation causes damage, and what effects it has. And this will be mainly for setting context, as I won't really go into any detail regarding 5G. That is for later. So, without further ado, Radiation is very much linked to radioactivity, and this is why the word is emphasized so much by the scaremongers, but there is so much more. But at least radioactivity is a good place to start. When we are talking about radioactivity, we really concern ourselves with atoms where the nucleus is unstable, and the nucleus may emit a particle in order to get to a more stable configuration. First, we have alpha decay, which involves the emission of an alpha particle, or a helium-4 nucleus. Now, this is a slow-moving ion with a positive charge, and it is highly reactive, as it will strip the electrons of something else nearby. Now, once it has taken these two electrons, it is fine. It would just be a neutral helium atom, and, well, that is one of the most inert substances known to man. But that does mean that something else has just lost some electrons and now has a positive charge and is highly reactive. The fact that alpha particles are relatively slow and carry a relatively large positive charge does mean that it is quick to react with stuff and therefore it doesn't have much of a penetration depth. In fact, a piece of paper will block it or even dense smoke. And this is how smoke detectors work. A smoke detector has an alpha source and a detector which are separated by a small air gap. Once the gap fills with denser smoke, the alpha particles interact with the smoke rather than the detector. The signal drops and the alarm goes off. Now, some of you may be asking why a helium-4 nucleus and not something else like a helium-3 or a proton or a deuterium. Well, there are reasons. I won't go into this video as that will come up when I address a different bit of nonsense that I have found on the internet. Now, our next type of radiation is beta decay, and this comes in two flavors, negative and positive. And these are processes that take place during nuclear transmutation. And this is where the number of protons in the nucleus changes, but the total number of nucleons doesn't. First, we have the rather boring beta minus decay, which is where a neutron converts to a proton. As you know, atoms don't fill their nuclei evenly with protons and neutrons, and you'll see that larger nuclei have more neutrons than protons, and this can result in a neutron with a certain amount of energy, whilst there is space available for a proton with less energy. And the universe is lazy, so the neutron can turn itself into a proton so it can move to that lower energy state. But to do so, it must get some positive charge to become that proton, or it can lose some negative charge. And it emits an electron along with an electron antineutrino to conserve angular momentum. Now, I call that one boring, but beta plus decay is pretty much the same process, but in reverse. A proton could populate a higher energy state whilst a lower energy neutron state is available, although this is quite rare. But it ditches its positive charge in the form of a positron and an electron neutrino. Now, why do I call beta minus decay the boring one? Well, firstly, Positrons are antiparticles, and this is cool, as they were accidentally predicted by Dirac when he tried to make sense of atomic spectra in terms of quantum mechanics and special relativity. 
Another interesting thing is that the positron will interact with an electron somewhere and it will annihilate. This produces two photons with an energy of 511 kilo electron volts and these photons travel in opposite directions and the exact amount of energy that they carry is predicted by the equation E equals mc squared. We can detect these photons in a PET scanner and that makes it really rather useful for diagnostic purposes, but this process also takes place in a banana. Unlike what some people claim, a banana is not proof of God, but it is proof of special relativity. Then there is something called electron capture. One of the inner electrons is captured by the nucleus and the proton becomes a neutron. Now, this leaves an empty space in the inner electron shells and a higher energy electron can move down to the shell and the spare energy is then dumped via the emission of an X-ray photons. So, I've mentioned photons a few times, so it's time to move on to gamma rays. Now, gamma rays are just high energy photons that are emitted by a nucleus as it relaxes to a lower energy state. We can take the example of cobalt-60, which decays to nickel-60 via beta minus decay, but the nickel-60 atom is in a higher energy state than in the ground state. So it emits a couple of photons as well. Firstly, a 1.17 mega electron volt pho photon, shortly followed by a 1.33 mega electron volt photon. And this allows it to move down to the ground state. Whenever there is a photon involved, we are talking about electromagnetic radiation, just like X-rays, ultraviolet light, visible light, or microwaves. And the distinction between the different types comes from the energy, which is a statement which is not entirely true, but still a useful guide. The distinction between X-rays and gamma rays, for example, is actually based on the source of the photon. If it comes from the nucleus, then it is a gamma ray. X-rays come from an electron relaxing to a lower energy state, not the nucleus. But the issue is that high energy X-rays actually have higher energies than the lowest energy gamma rays. So that's how that distinction by energy doesn't quite work. But that is a useless technicality for our purpose. When we are talking about X-rays or gamma rays, we are talking about ionizing radiation. And this means that if one of these photons were to hit an electron in an atom, then it would impart enough energy to the electron for it to be knocked out of its orbit and away from the atom. And this leaves a positively charged ion, and these are very reactive. Now, some energies in the UV range are also sufficient to do this, along with messing things up in entirely different ways, which are also quite unpleasant. But when we drop down to visible light, the photon no longer has sufficient energy to do anything like that. But let's consider the damage that can be caused by these types of radiation. Now, there are two ways in which the damage can be caused, and the first is pretty straightforward. The particle hits the cell's DNA and ionizes an atom in the DNA molecule or just breaks one of the chemical bonds in the DNA, and this is bad news. The other way is far more common, and that is that the particle hits water molecules in the cell, and this can create peroxide-free radicals, which are extremely reactive. And these reactive species can interact with parts of the cells and most troubling the DNA. Now the issue here is that it can cause damage to one of the DNA strands or both. In the latter case the cell was most definitely screwed. Fortunately the body has many mechanisms to deal with radiation. After all we are constantly being bombarded with radiation from all directions by virtue of pretty much everything being slightly radioactive and our planet being heated by a large fusion reactor that makes everything feel, well, nice and toasty. There is a fun fact which I forgot to mention in the original recording, and that is that every cell in your body will have its DNA damaged about 500,000 times every day. When a particle hits a water molecule in the cell, antioxidants which are naturally present tend to react with the free radicals and render them inert. But even if they don't, the free radicals are most likely to react with something where it really hasn't got much of an effect. Now, there is a small chance that the DNA gets damaged though, but even then, most likely, you're fine. Cells have complex mechanisms which can actually deal with this issue quite well, and the DNA can be repaired. Most of the time, this works well. However, there will be some cases where it doesn't, and then a different process called apoptosis is initiated. And this is also called programmed cell death. 
If the DNA damage can't be fixed, then the self-destruct button is activated and the cell just kills itself. Now, in some cases, apoptosis fails to be triggered, but then there's the very high probability that it is fine anyway because the DNA damage is on a bit that does nothing to the cell or it just stops the cell from functioning anyway and it will quickly die. But after all this, there is a chance that the cell still works and is still able to reproduce. Some of these damaged cells just reproduce much faster and have way higher metabolism, in which case you have a cancer cell. Fortunately, the higher reproduction rate and the metabolism also means that the new cancer cell is, well, not very good at repairing itself. And this is something that we can take advantage of in treatment. In radiation therapy, we try to deliver a high dose of radiation to a tumor site whilst delivering a small dose to healthy tissue, coupled with the fact that healthy tissue is just far better at repairing the radiation damage. This means that even though radiotherapy is really shitty for healthy tissue, it is even shittier for the tumor. Now, there are different ways in which radiation therapy is administered. First, we have teletherapy, which involves well, a collimated beam of x-rays or gamma rays which are aimed at the tumor. Now to keep the dose low for the healthy tissue, the angle at which the beam comes in is changed. So only a small volume at the center of rotation receives a high dose. And this is where the tumor would have to be. Then we have brachytherapy, where we take some radioactive seeds and inject them into the tumor. The radiation sources used for this generally decay via beta minus decay or electron capture, but sometimes alpha gamma emitters are also used. Now, in this case, you want relatively uh, short penetration depths, but not too short, obviously. Finally, we have straight up nuclear medicine to treat certain tumors, most notably thyroid cancer, where the patient just drinks iodine-131 solution as the thyroid absorbs iodine. The, this concentrates the radionuclide, and therefore the dose, on the thyroid. And this is also why people chow down iodine pills in case of nuclear disasters, because iodine-131 is one of the really scary products of nuclear reactors. But if you already have a lot of iodine in your system, then the thyroid will already be swamped with the stable iodine, and the radioactive stuff is just not absorbed and excreted. Now, there are some other ways in which to treat cancers via radiation, namely hadron therapy, where you fire protons or carbon-12 ions at the tumor, but that's for another time. So, this is a brief overview of radioactive stuff and its effects on the body. Now, what has this got to do with 5G? Nothing. But this is a complex topic, and it is this kind of stuff that the scaremongers want you to think of when they emphasize the word radiation when talking about 5G. Now, remember that I said that a photon needs a large amount of energy to actually ionize a particle, and that visible light doesn't have enough energy to do that. Well, the frequencies at which 5G operates carry four to five orders of magnitude less energy than visible light. So 5G cannot ionize anything. Of course, all that may have just come across as a long walk for a short drink of water, but it is the journey that counts. And hopefully you now know a bit more about radiation. Now, I will not dismiss the potential of non-ionizing radiation to cause damage. It really can, but the mechanisms are very different, and this is key. Now, I will cut the video here because this is getting on a bit. In the next video, we will talk about water and how microwaves interact with it. We will cover how microwaves can cause damage and about how 5G, well, really doesn't. So I would like to thank my patrons who are Kate Ebnetter, Walter Bislin, Rob Parks, Johnny Ragadu, Michael Dean, Alexander, Nick, Mike Harris, Paul Bates, and Albert Red, Radek Stajny, Paul Schnuz, Stan Zay, Steph, Cy Blacklock, Hughes, Stringer News 1, MC Toon, The Slider, Mark Edwards, Richmond Clemens, Luca Schmidt, Duranku Kaibroking, Michelle Randall, and Gently's Channel. And of course, all the anonymous donors. You know who you are, and you rock. But that was it from me. If you want to support me and my channel, you know where to go. Uh, when this video comes out, I may have launched memberships. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to do this yet. But thank you all for popping along, and thank you for watching, and you will catch me soon.